Hey, and welcome to Foolproof Theology. My name is Chase Davis, and I am your host. I am glad to be with you here today. Thank you for bearing with me as I took a few weeks off to do some studying and a little bit of vacation while I was on sabbatical. I'm glad to be back in the saddle this morning, episode 50. We've got Graham Shearer here on the podcast. Graham, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a great honor. Well, we had to kind of go through the time difficulties of you being over in Belfast. Is that right? I'm in Belfast. Yeah, I'm not in the safe room of an insane, insane asylum, despite the indication my background might might give. I'm actually at, <laughs> uh, in a, in a at Union Theological College in Belfast, where I'm uh, studying for a PhD. That's great. Um, I've been really encouraged by Graham's writing over the last few years, uh, particularly that's when I was kind of introduced to him. I think the first article I saw was an article in response to Russell Moore, which I'll drop in the show notes, but I don't think we'll get into this morning. Uh, Graham is a PhD student at Union, like he just mentioned, and he lives over there. And, I, you know, like I do with any guest on the show, I'd love to hear from you, Graham, a bit of your biographic information. How did you end up uh, doing a PhD? Maybe what is your PhD on? Uh, are you from Belfast? Uh, just anything you want to share with uh, with our listeners? Thanks. Yeah. Well, British British listeners will uh, viewers will immediately identify. I'm not from Belfast. Uh, I grew. I was born in uh, London, um, and uh, I grew up in a Christian home. I came to faith as a teenager, about fourteen uh, or so. Um, and studied history at university, which was um, mainly kind of modern British and American political history. Um, I, had a, I just kind of wanted to learn as little as possible, so I studied the things I sort of already knew a little bit about. Um, and um, uh, I'm I'm married with three kids. We met my, I went, met my wife, who is from from Northern Ireland, at, at, uh, at university. Um, we got married a few years later, and we've now had since had three children. Um, and um, uh, I have uh, I was I worked in on in campus ministry for a while, um, doing um, work with with uh, kind of the UK equivalent of InterVarsity um, in the UK, and uh, that was quite kind of apologetics focused, um, so sort of helping to to help to train people to to speak on campus in in apologetics contexts um and then move from from that ministry to um to seminary to train for the pastorate um left seminary uh, that was what uh, four years ago now and uh, had two years as a as a pastor in east london um in a, in a baptist church in east london um and um, our time came to an end there and we were kind of thinking what to the, what should we uh, do next and few people have suggested doing further study and the opportunity here at Union uh, came up. It meant moving uh, nearer to my wife's family, which was uh, attractive to her. And um, I listened to a talk by a guy called Michael Ward, who is the guy who's written Planet Narnia, the kind of big C.S. Lewis scholar. I don't know if you've ever come across him. And he was doing a talk on C.S. Lewis's view of liberal education. And okay. his definition of liberal education is, a, is an education um, that is uh, pursued for the, sake of it, for the sake of itself, for the sake of knowledge itself, rather than to kind of as an instrumental means to anything else. And um, I listened to that talk and I was thinking about what to do. And it sort of inspired me that uh, whatever doing a PhD might lead to, and uh, it might lead to very little, uh, <laughs> many people have, have told me, um, that there was something intrinsically valuable in, in dedicating oneself if you have the opportunity to, uh, to, study, um, uh, to study anything, really, to, to just to, to know the truth. But particularly my area of study is on uh, the Trinity, on God himself, on the, uh, the highest end of, of man, and trying to understand uh, what it means that that God is, is triune and, and, uh, father, son, and spirit. So, um, so that's kind of what inspired me to take the plunge and, uh, move over here to, to commence my studies. That's great. And on that particular topic, uh, I mean, that's a pretty weighty topic. Are you, you're still pursuing that as your, uh, your dissertation, your research. That's great. Is I'm assuming that's going to delve into issues of classical theism, in, in modern issues, or is it more of a historical theology? What are you kind of looking at there? 
I'm, yeah, I'm focused on the question of whether when the father generates the son in eternity, um, he does so by uh, communicating the divine essence uh, to him. Um, and that had been a kind of uh, the understanding of, of, of theologians throughout church history um, until really, I think, until John Calvin came along. Um, and John Calvin had a, a slightly different view um, and uh, that the, the, the son receives his personhood rather than um, his essence from the father. Uh, mm. And that's kind of trickled down into Reformed theology more widely. Um, and um, I, there, was a, there was a very, very, very good book, um, a PhD written under John Webster by a guy called Brandon Ellis about 10 years ago, which made the argument that this is really, Calvin was absolutely spot on on this. Um, and I had done a bit of study at, at college, which led me to believe that probably wasn't I, I didn't think that was quite right and that, that there were some issues with that um it was all obviously we were all we were all thinking about the trinity back in 2016 and the the efs debate and, and so on um and so that kind of led me to be interested in that area um and so i've spent um so i've been trying to kind of understand well what you know what, what do we mean by essence what do we mean by person when we're talking about these things um how did how have prior theologians understood things how have they put things together and why, why did they make the moves they did um and uh this year has really been focused on the kind of medieval debates um in the in the 11th 12th and 13th up, up to sort of 14th century um which uh i i it's certainly been good for my intellectual humility because i realize that i don't really i don't have anything i don't have anything like as good a grasp of what's going on as, as some of these guys did but um uh, but it, i think it's deep certainly deep in my understanding of of what the com- church is confessing when when we say that that god is father son and spirit that's great. That, those are weighty topics, and, and they kind of pale in comparison to some of the stuff we'll be talking about in terms of uh, kind of modern era, uh, what we're facing today. Although I'm sure for many listeners, they're more interested in the articles we're going to discuss, but those are very deep topics, and I, I don't envy the work you have to do and the heavy lifting there. So I appreciate that there's people out there like you who are uh, doing that work, because you get into all sorts of you know philosophical debates on metaphysics that, uh, that quite frankly... Uh, go over my head often. And so I, I appreciate the work you're doing. Um, one of the articles I want to discuss first, you, you shared it with me actually this morning, um, and I think it would set the stage for the other articles. So, um, you know, we've obviously been living over the last two years, uh, and that's part of the reason I started my podcast, where we had government restrictions over a worldwide pandemic. Um, and I started the podcast to talk with people who uh, we're seeing things that I was kind of seeing and wanted to connect with them and share their ideas with other people. And so I thought it might be a good place to start because you said that it did kind of shape kind of how uh, you've recently been articulating your understanding of church and state and government. And so in that article, what you do, and I'll drop a link to it in the show notes, is you kind of lay out how a Christian uh, conceives of government. And so I was wondering if you might be able to give us a brief cursory overview of, of kind of the the big idea in that article regarding uh, kind of coronavirus, your experience on the ground over there in, in Belfast, and uh, how how we conceive of government today. Sure, sure. Well, when the, when the the uh, coronavirus crisis started, I was I was pastoring a church in in London back then. Um, okay. And initially, I'm sure, like almost everybody, um, I was very, you know, very concerned about the disease, and was actually probably. Um, you know, on the side of kind of certainly in terms of church activities, shutting down more more quickly because we had we had a quite an Ill, elderly congregation or a, a proportion of our congregation that's quite elderly, and you know I was very concerned that they might catch COVID at a, a church lunch or something like that, and you know shouldn't should we just cut that back and, and play things safe? Um, and I remember sitting our kids down when you know to explain that their school was going to be shut and they were going to be staying at home and that was to slow the spread and make sure the hospitals weren't overwhelmed and so on um but a number but uh, uh, you know after three the, the first three weeks you know three weeks to flatten the curve and so on as time went on i became i i became aware that, that there was something 
um, sort of there was there was a deeper malaise being being uh, kind of revealed that the the kind of initially you thought oh yeah you know this is quite good because the culture seems to be concerned about human life the preservation of life it's it's seems to be turning away from um, kind of economic priorities you know we talk about how you know economics has become kind of dominant in our culture but here's something where where businesses were were closing and so on but as it went on, I began to feel that that that, that the the kind of extinguishing of um, human societal human society s- s- social links, the digitization of so much of of life, um, just wasn't wasn't um, uh, sustainable or or, or or justified by the by the threat that the virus posed. Um, mm. And I began to kind of reflect on what. Um, you know what was behind this, and it struck, struck me this was a very kind of modern uh, approach to dealing with these things. So fundamentally, we viewed it as a problem to be solved rather than a trial uh, to be uh, endured. There was a, there was a mm. sense that um, if we could just get the right government policies, you know, the death rate would be would be changed and, and fundamentally altered. Um, and obviously, there was a, there's a, there's a case for doing things to stop to stop death you know, a death sure. and so on. But it, it seemed to me reasonably quickly as you saw the different kind of the, you know, the different dots on the graphs and so on in terms of, you know, viral spread and so on, that, that this just wasn't something that was within the grasp of human ingenuity to to control in the way that we were being told, oh, well, you know, if you stand this far apart, if you have a screen in front of the cashier in the restaurant or you have you know, the, this will all save lives and so on. And it just struck me that right. that, was, that was highly unlikely. Um, right. And then the whole way in which statistical modeling uh, was used to, um, to kind of micromanage um, uh, the, 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 the decisions that should be made and the way that that was appealed to as a kind of, oh, well, we're just doing what the science tells us. Mm. I, I knew enough about history to know that, that those kind of claims to tot- to totalizing uh, knowledge of a situation were almost always bogus uh, made by by anybody, um, and fund- and also fundamentally that um, the the appeal to the state, which I think was fundamental, the appeal to the state and the way in which there was no consideration um, uh, that that uh, there was no there was no area of life that the state could could. F- um, was prevented from from interfering with. There was nothing. There was no. There was no place where the state's writ did not run. Uh, whether it was right. how whether a, a son could comfort his mother at a funeral, whether a father could visit, um, could could be with his wife, uh, with, with the mother of his baby uh, at their birth. Th- these kind of things. There was nothing that the state couldn't say. No, no. We 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 know better than you. We can we control this better. We can control this better than you. Um, and you know. I had always, I remember I did a bit of study on, on, on the thoughts of, um, of Hegel, uh, the German, mm. the German idealist philosopher back in the night, in the early 19th century. And I, my, my knowledge of Hegel is, is very secondhand and very, very sketchy, but I, I remember when I read, um, kind of accounts of his thought, feeling that he was very influential on the way that the modern world has been shaped. Um, and one of the things that Hegel, Hegel basically had this philosophy of progress that um, human society gets, uh, gets better, uh, stronger over time in, in all areas as we, we come to kind of absolute self-consciousness. Um, and where Hegel kind of located that uh, was in the state. Um, okay. One of the places he located that, the, the, the state becomes the kind of repository of all human um, authority, human longing, uh, human actualization, the state is the the, uh, the there is no uh, um, authority above the state to which you can appeal to because the state is is kind of human beings kind of conglom- uh, um, conglomerated together. Right, and it struck me that this is what was going on in the way that the the coronavirus was, was being handled that. That this vision of the state as the kind of um, the the 
the kind of focus of all of our identity, all our hope. You know, they, the state was the one who was going to rescue us from, from a virus, was going to d tell us when we could see our families, was going to manage how we conducted our weddings, how, how, we, how many people we could have in a, in a, in a, around for a meal. All of these things depended on that kind of conception of of, mm. uh, of the government and that this was a, a a shift a fundamental shift from from the way things had been understood uh before um and i didn't really i mean when i was pastoring as i said when i was initially pastoring the church um i was in favor of of kind of more cautious restrictions um and it and by the time i wrote the articles you mentioned i was um had, had left was was on my way to, to transitioning to full-time study so I felt I had a bit more freedom to speak about these things because sure. there was a kind of um I don't know what it was like fit for you guys in 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 Boulder but you know there was a huge social pressure to you know it, stick with the narrative encourage people to abide by the restrictions because to do anything else was was socially irresponsible um right and so it's only when I got to the kind of the autumn of 2020 that I felt, well, actually, I think I should, I should just on my small, you know, my small little way, um, just kind of try and try and offer a, a counter voice uh, along with, with many others as well. Yeah, that's great. And that's, that's about the same time I started writing uh, a couple of articles through mere orthodoxy. And some of my elders were questioning, you know, is this the, the wise thing to do? And, and, uh, and so we prayed about that and considered that and, and ultimately, you know, the pros outweighed the cons in terms of the reputation of the ministry or, or, or things like that. Um, but one thing that you said in the article that really struck me that I've, I've weighed as well. And I've talked with my wife and my friends about is, uh, is how, you know, in pagan cultures where they made sacrifices when either disease, famine, plague, or whatever it was, things that were outside of their control would happen. We typically look down on them like, oh, those brutes, they're so unenlightened, they don't know what they're doing. And yet in some ways, there's a bit of wisdom in their humility, right? And their deference to realize that there are things outside of human and state control that we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot regulate into, uh, uh, oblivion we cannot control so that it, it extinguishes and we have to rely on something out, outside of ourselves and so as societies become more secular and by that I mean more atheistic mm. um, it, it has resulted in a more totalitarian kind of uh, focus where the government becomes this what you called a uh, kind of a pure distillation of the essence of the ideals of a society mm. where the state embodies that kind of essence and uh, how unwise that is, you know, compared to uh, the way I think about it is this way. In some ways, it's easier to reach somebody with the gospel who uh, who believes in a kind of a pagan uh, ideology or even somebody I could argue that is a very big Marvel fan, you know, who believes in superheroes. There's uh, there's gospel opportunities there to talk about aspirations, values, desires. It's harder to reach a people who are almost nihilistic. Right when there's nothing outside of ourselves, the, we have an imminent framework where the only uh, form of engagement and hope is in the material world. A very materialistic mm. society can be hard to reach with the gospel because you have to lift their eyes up. You have to uh, confront that society in both gentle and hard ways with the reality of God's existence, and that can be a bit more challenging than almost reaching a pagan people who believe in kind of this pantheon of gods. Um, but I found that a really interesting mm. insight in that article. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Is it Acts, is it Acts 14, I think, isn't it, when Paul comes to, um, oh, it's not Derby, what's the, the other, the other, one of the other, those other cities, and, um, you know, they, they want to sacrifice to him as a, as him and, uh, um, who's he with by that point, is it Barnabas, um, as, as gods, you know, and he's able to say, no, you know, look, but, Right. God has God has not left himself without a witness. You know, he's he, he's not. I'm I'm just a fellow man. I'm I'm a man of like passions, like, as you are. Um, and and yes, there is that uh, um, that yearning for transcendence. That um, that 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 acknowledgement of the, the the transcendent that that comes in those kind of pagan religions. Um, you know, someone like C.S. Lewis is always kind of. Show, tr trying to draw the connections you know and say paganism is in in some ways a kind of a, a 
preparation for the gospel even. Um, but I, I think what, what's happened in our society is that the the trick that as a, and a, I know I'm, I'm talk about him a lot, but you know what what Hegel does is locate transcendence um, within human consciousness. So he is an, a nihilist in this. He believes in an absolute. He believes in a in a in a in a, in a reality that is um, that brings adds value to society to, to to nature. He doesn't. He's not a kind of um, a nihilist in the sense of of saying all of these things are just illusions. Sure. Where he locates it is in the the kind of the actualization the the the. Um, the, the coming to self consciousness of the human of the human of the human consciousness of the human mind um, that there is no there is so there is a mind there is it there is sort of value and immaterial uh, consciousness um, but it is it's located nowhere else other than in humanity and and there's debates there's scholarly debates about what exactly Hegel believed about God but I think in our sure. society you have huge appeals to to tra kind of transcendent values, you know, to to to, to right and wrong. Ca you know, cancel right. culture, cancel culture does not work in a morally vacuous universe. It, you know, you, you, you're saying these things these things are wrong. You know, they 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 make me unsafe or, or whatever. Um, but they they flow from um, that the, the, they they are not appeals to it to a higher law giver. They're appeals to uh, the authority of the human will, the authority of the human will kind of somehow conglomerated in a, in a particular identity or, or understanding. And I think um, that does mean that, that the state uh, becomes the kind of, is, is the best candidate for the repository of that. You know, it's the best candidate to say, who is it that's going to represent this, you know, this human consciousness, this geist, it's going to be it's going to be the state it's going to be the, right. the, the one who claims governance over over us all um and i think you're right that that we haven't quite i think um we we're, we need to we need to do some i mean i'm sure someone like james wood you know who's who's doing all this kind of french 20th century catholic theology that that's grappling with these things but i think for someone like me and and the kind of wider evangelical world we haven't really formulated res good responses to this kind of this new world that we live in. Absolutely. And that's part of the reason I'm interested in history personally, is I feel like surely we can't be the only people that have ever had these ideas, you know? And so one of the articles you wrote on Calvin and Liberty, um, you kind of uh, highlighted several different uh, ideas. Um, and you talked about the, uh, and you talked about Kuiper in there and kind of his reaction to populism, but also, uh, another framework, but right off the top, I really appreciate in the article is something I've wrestled with as well as sometimes in church history, like for Calvin, he, uh, he really didn't have a theology of resisting the state. Um, maybe that came later. I think I've seen some of it developed over his time, but in general, the, the kind of resounding point is like, you shouldn't resist. Uh, whereas obviously, uh, different reformers had a different perspective, like Zwingli, uh, and, and other people. And so, um, walk me through kind of like, okay, so we get, we go from Calvin in the, in the 16th century, um, to then Kuiper in the, the 19th century, uh, giving his lectures on Calvinism. And then all of a sudden he, he kind of posits that Calvinism properly understood, uh, should have some sort of resistance or counter or, uh, conception of the state. Can you kind of walk me through the logic with Kuiper and, uh, yeah. and his response? Yeah, I mean, this is an area I'm still still studying and still grappling to understand. But you're right. I think that Calvin is very cautious about resistance. I think it's there's there's one moment at the end of the Institutes where he talks about the the magistrates of the people, who you know, he locates any any resistance has to come from another magistrate. This is Luther's. Um, this is Luther's view as well, and it was why Luther was eventually persuaded to to back the the Lutheran resistance to the the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, but he said he talks about you know maybe there are these magistrates of the people who might who might have a role or who should who do have a role in in resisting uh, tyranny. 
but his his general demeanor is you know pray endure you know and and just hope the lord will bring deliverance mm -hmm. um and but what happens is in 1572 so um what's that about 10 years after calvin dies you have the st bartholomew's day massacre where um the 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 the, the kind of queen regent of france uh, catherine de Medici, de Medici um massacres several thousand we don't quite know how many uh huguenot french protestants um starting from the kind of noblemen down into it just becomes kind of mob violence against them wow and this um catalyzes kind of resistance as you would imagine but the 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 Huguenot need to have an account theologically of why they are able to resist uh, the right. king, and um, you get a book, um, this book, uh, Vindicii contra Tyrannos, which is um, anonymously people think probably Philip, de, a guy called Philip de Mornay wrote it. Um, and this is a, this is late sixteenth uh, century, and what they start appealing to is the idea of the covenant, um, and they say, look. Uh, political authority is not given um, purely to the king. The king is not a um, is, is not a kind of absolute ruler who alone has a relationship to God, uh, but instead the whole people, the whole nation, have a, a relationship to God. They appeal to a moment in in two Kings eleven where um, there's a king uh, crowned and he's crowned. Um, with a, there's a covenant between uh, the king and the people and between the king the people and god and so they're all they're all in covenant together um, and what the vindicii uh, says is that when the king breaks that covenant with god and with the people uh, the mm. people are the kind of executors they're the, the they're the um the stewards of that covenant um, and in fact um, the king, uh, the, the the people appoint the king, uh, rather than um, the, the the king having having kind of priority over the people. So that is, you know, that he the, the writer asks you, are there kings going around looking for peoples? Uh, do kings get created first, and then and then the peoples who they rule, or is it that you mm -hmm. have peoples, and then from the people, uh, kings Comes emerge, king. and 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 right. obviously you know as you see in the history of israel that that's it's it's the latter it's, it's that uh, peoples uh, have priority so um so what they say is is look we have a responsibility under god to resist uh, the tyranny uh, of um uh, of this tyrant of of the, the the king of france um and it's not just that uh we uh, kind of we have a you know, a license to do this. We actually have an obligation to do it. We have an obligation to um, to resist a king who is acting unlawfully. Uh, so law is not just whatever the king says. Law is um, when human communities act in harmony with the eternal moral character of God. And when a king mm. starts, when a king starts making laws that uh, prevent right worship of God and, and so on. Uh, there's a duty to resist there's a duty initially on the on the, the 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 kind of the lesser magistrates that you know the people who are who have political authority within the system but but fundamentally uh, the people have a the people as a whole have a responsibility in in maintaining um, that covenant um and that kind of gets that becomes a kind of stream within protestant political uh, theology um it's probably worth saying that, that prior to this, you know, that this is a kind of Protestant problem because in the in the pre-Reformation times, you had kings um, and you had popes. And mm -hmm. you, uh, if you had a problem with the king, um, you could appeal to the pope and you could say to the pope, look, this king is this king is is um, is oppressing us. He's he's a, a, acting unlawfully. Do you know, send us another king, excommunicate right. him. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure how well that system worked, but in theory there was a kind of balancing between the between the two, and you had often you had sure. conflicts between kings and popes as to who had authority to do what. Once you get rid of the pope, the question is: Well, 
are you just left with kings now? Um, right. This is the, this is the you know Catholic kind of Roman Catholic um, critique of Protestantism is that it leaves you defenseless against um, tyrannical kings. There's no one else sure. to appeal to, and so the um, and so the, the, the Protestants emphasise this 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 kind of counterbalance to the king of, of the people, um, and, and it is in the tradition. I was I found a, a bit in, in in Aquinas actually that that speaks. Uh, of of that this idea um, as well, but but it's it's certainly emphasised. So by the time you get to the 17th century in England, and you have King Charles the First, who's who's trying to impose um, a much kind of higher Anglican uh, liturgy on the Scots, uh, who are you know obviously historically Presbyterian, um, but he's have you know by that that point it's about 50, 60 years of Presbyterianism that prompts a rebellion and they appeal to these kind of ideas and uh, that rebellion spreads uh, and eventually parliament in England as well rebels against Charles I. Um, and this is the grounds upon which, which they do so. They say, look, you have acted so badly. You've made war upon your own people and thus mm. we have the authority to, um, to uh, overthrow him, uh, overthrow you. Um, and, when you get to, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on this by any stretch of the imagination, but when you read the Declaration of Independence, you have a very similar kind of idea that the, the, the people uh, under this under this tyrant, as they want to characterise George III, uh, appeal to providence. They appeal to a higher authority to say, we are, uh, you know, we are, um, we're we're appealing to you because this this figure has broken the covenant that that he uh, made with us and it's not saying there's a kind of explicit stated covenant but it's saying all the kind of the human the existence of the state as a, a of the kind of political community relies upon these kind of of, of arrangements um right and and so when when kuiper is looking back at this history um, obviously, with a, with a Dutch perspective as well, and the Dutch see themselves very much in this in this tradition as well. Um, he he wants to show, as he speaks in, in at Princeton in, in the late nineteenth century, um, that it's Calvinism that has generated political liberty, uh, because mm. Calvinism that has said to the states, "You are under the authority of one who is higher than you, and the people have the authority to." Um, uh, as it were, draw you back under that authority when you seek okay. to, to transcend it, when you seek to escape uh, from under it. Um, whereas other theories of, of kind of state power, whether that's being a state power deriving from the kind of um, the, 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 the liberty of the individual, um, or whether it's kind of this sort of Hegelian kind of, you know, you're the, you're the pure distillation of, of, of kind of human consciousness, um, there's no principle by which the state's power can be restricted. Uh, there's no, right. no, there's no, there's no standard to which anyone can appeal. Uh, but there's also no, um, no alternative body that can be appealed to because the state and the people are just kind of fused, uh, fused together. Um, right. And, um, and and so whereas whereas in the Calvinist conception. Um, the state, the people have a responsibility to obey the state and honor honor the their rulers and, and so on. But but that responsibility operates within a framework of 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 a, of a of a of a covenant that is is under God. Yes, and I think that there's a motto for the state of Vermont, I believe it is, and uh, or at least there's a flag I think that's associated with Vermont. Uh, I think New Hampshire's is "Live Free or Die," which is very American. Uh, but somewhat consistent with the tradition. And then Vermont's, uh, they have ones that says an appeal to heaven. And that's what's coming to mind when I'm yes. hearing you talk about this, is that we make an appeal to heaven. We're not just making an appeal that's a populist appeal to what's popular or, or what the, the common will of the people is currently, but we're making an appeal to the, to, to the God of the universe. Right. And so um, that's a very curious kind of overlap. And I, I'm starting to kind of put some pieces together in my own thinking yeah. on those topics. Um, the it kind of ties into the last topic and and this kind of gets to uh to why I was very excited to have you on the podcast because it's it's rare to find a baptist who is uh who's thinking on these matters with such a good historical perspective often we get baptists who are well I don't know what they are but they're they're very uh captured it seems by the ideas of the age currently 
Um, I, I sometimes refer to myself as a magisterial Baptist. I don't know if you've employed that terminology before. Um, not, not, not in company, but I, I, you know, I like to, I like to, to repeat the phrase over, over in, in private, private meditation. I think it's Joe, <laughs> I heard it from Joe Rigney, who's, uh, who's, yes. uh, I, I, who's thought I enjoy on this, these topics. Yes. Yeah. And so there's uh, I think there's dozens of us out there that are magisterial Baptist, uh, but there's only a few. <laughs> there's only a few that are willing to kind of share their ideas publicly on the matter, but uh, you're one of those few. And so you've written a response to Russell Moore. I'll put that in the show notes. But really the uh, the second part of that um, was really curious to me because I had, I'd been listening to a lot of Presbyterians. Um, and even in my own research, I'm reading on uh, Thomas Hooker and his interaction with Samuel Rutherford. So Hooker's a Congregationalist and Rutherford's a Presbyterian. And they're going back and forth. Um on these matters. And so Presbyterians will make the argument that Baptists don't really have a place uh, to speak of kind of state involvement or kind of a magisterial kind of reformer attitude because Baptists uh, kind of reduce the relationship with God to the individual choice. And um, and so there's some stuff Stephen Wolfe and, and others have said on this matter. I, I, it, it's not just him. There's a lot of people that have said this. But you make the case, and I'd love for you to share that case with my listeners, you make the case that Baptists are in line with the Reformation and that uh, not a, they, have a, they had a place, they still have a place, and it's, it's, uh, it's natural and good for Baptists to kind of advocate for, um, I think in the article you go so far as to say to advocate for a Christian state. Is that correct? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think correctly understood that that is, yes, that is what we should, we should advocate for because, you know, we're Christians and we think that Jesus is, is Lord of all and, and, that, and not only is he Lord of all, he's also, also best of all. And so a government, a state that's informed by his wisdom, by his love, his grace, um, by his, uh, by his righteousness is, is likely to be- benefit everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've been helped by on, on this kind of stuff by the, the work of uh, Matthew Bingham. Okay. Um, who is, a, is actually an American guy, American uh, scholar who uh, did his PhD here in Belfast at, at Queen's, Queen's University just over the road. Um, um, and he's now at the college that I, the, the seminary that I, that I attended, though he arrived after, uh, after I did. But he, he wrote his PhD on the, and it's now um, uh, an Oxford University Press uh, book, um, on the origins of the Baptist movement. And he actually okay. says the term Baptist that we, use, you know, that we would use now and kind of know what we mean um, is an anachronism. The, 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 the earliest Baptists didn't think of themselves as Baptists. Um, mm. And most of the scholarship that you, that you read on, on the sort of 17th century English Baptists is you have what are called the general Baptists and the particular Baptists. And the general refers to the extent of the atonement so basically the general baptists are more arminian minded the particular baptists are more uh calvinist minded and but they're kind of seen as kind of two sides two wings of the same movement whereas what bingham shows is that actually the particular baptists um didn't really have anything to do with the the general baptists they didn't see themselves as kind of part of the same movement what they were were there was pe- there were people within the the kind of late Elizabethan early uh, Jacobean Church of England in the early seventeenth century who became convinced of um, congregationalism of independency and who began to form churches uh, organized on that on that basis um, and amongst those so that that would include people like John Owen and and uh, um, I think Hooker Thomas Hooker was a, a congregationalist yeah. and, um, uh, um, Thomas Goodwin, those kind of people. Uh, amongst those, some then became persuaded that the the, the right um, recipients of baptism were were those who were able to make a profession of faith. Um, but in making that move, they didn't kind of throw over everything that they had believed and everything that they had understood. They were still well within the the kind of Puritan stream, the the, the what we call the magisterial reform the reform stream. Um, Whereas the general Baptists did tend to be more connected with the, the Anabaptist, the radical Reformation. Um, and there's kind of scholarship on exactly how 
close that relationship was, but, but that was certainly the case. Um, and what you get then is when um, the, uh, the, the, par the, the, the parliament and eventually the, through the army, the independents, gain a degree of political ascendancy in the 1650s, they then begin to try to reform the church uh, in a way that is um, that fits with their uh, with their um, kind of understanding. And most of the the independents are congregationalists. There's, there's some some kind of terminological difference, but a lot of independents are congregationalists, and amongst those are are what we would call Baptists. Um, and what Bingham points out is that these these people who were practicing uh, or who rather weren't practicing infant baptism serve in all sorts of um, significant positions uh, so there's a guy called uh, Henry Lawrence who I think is I think he's like Lord Lord Chief Protector of the High Council or some some, some sort of you know it's an important title you know if you've got sure. if you've got Lord and Chief in your job title you've got some heavy responsibility so he, <laughs> he's a Baptist he's um, and, and there's other, a, a, a number of others as well that I mentioned in the article uh, from, from Bingham's work. Um, now, what, what they don't... Know, so what they do is they get... They, they no longer um, enforce liturgical uniformity in the way that the, the prayer book had done, that the Book of Common Prayer and the Anglican setup had done. Um, and, or even that the, the, the kind of Presbyterian Parliament of the late 1640s was, was aiming to do. What they do is they have a kind of basic reformed, uh, kind of, you know, what we call small c Catholic, reformed Protestant sort of um, frame, doctrinal framework. It's, it's not too dissimilar to what you might find in the kind of Gospel Coalition websites or, you know, um, some a, a kind of generic evangelical organization now. Right. Um, and they say, if you if you sign, if you agree with this, that's absolutely fine. And then the magistrate uh, pays for for ministers, church ministers. Um, but those ministers can organize their churches or the churches can organize themselves in any way they like. So you can have presbyteries and networks of presbytery. Um, or you can be congregational, and within that you can be Baptistic or, or Peter Baptist. Um, and then there are the kind of committees to make sure the people who are receiving that funding are really orthodox and they're not immoral and so on. They're called the triers and the ejectors. Um, so what you have is a kind of pan-Protestant, pan-Reformed uh, kind of system, um, which includes... Uh, which which allows for a variety of different kind of policies, different liturgies, uh, but has a um, a kind of co a coherence around the confession of Christ as as Lord, um, and and a self conscious understanding of the nation as a uh, as a Protestant nation. Now, you know, I'm not saying everything about that system was was fantastic and everything about that system worked really well it only lasted you know <laughs> it kind of collapsed in on itself uh though who knows what would have happened if if oliver cromwell had lived a little bit longer and they could have sorted out the succession a bit better but but you know there are obviously issues with that setup but right. i think there certainly is a kind of it did um actually that by the time you get to the end of the 17th century with the act of toleration and the, the, the glorious revolution here, something like that system actually now arrived. You don't have to go to an Anglican church to be a, a kind of upstanding citizen of, of the, the, the United Kingdom uh, anymore. And certainly by the time you get to the, with the, with the founding of the United States, you know, what you've got at the federal level is, is yes, you have established churches in many of the States, but some of them are Anglican and some of them are congregational and, and so on, and at the federal level, there's a there's a kind of understanding of the nation as um, under God and and being, um, you know, I would I I, I think that the, the U.S. was a, a kind of self consciously Christian nation. I, you know, I know there's right. some debate about that, but a self consciously Christian nation, but that does not demand liturgical or or uh, liturgical conformity or or polit conformity in policy. Um, and I think that means that that's a that's a helpful framework for thinking about how do we now that you know we do have we you know not only do we have different do we have Baptists and Presbyterians but we've got you know 
any number of different flavours of Presbyterian, any number of different flavours of Baptist, even for different flavours of Anglican, how how do we how could we advocate for um, what would it mean to advocate for a Christian nation? Does it mean that we all have to say these bishops or this presbytery is the church, and anyone that that operates outside of their remit is is not a Christian? That that right. seems unlikely to me. Um, but I think we must say on the basis of the whole Christian political tradition, that when the state no longer acknowledges uh, a divine lawgiver, it becomes a law unto itself. Uh, and it actually therefore becomes lawless. That if we're going to have laws which we can obey, um, which we, we, we obey in good conscience, that we say that resonate with the way things are, then we need the state to... Um, to to um, to acknowledge something above itself, acknowledge a, rea- a reality, a creator above itself, and I think sometimes we we get confused between the difference between a limited state and a neutral state. Mm. Um, and I would say, in order for you know, I think a lot of the kind of Baptist concern, contemporary Baptist concern, is to say we don't want a state that tells us we have to say these particular words every Sunday uh, in sure. this particular way. Because we want, instead, we want a limited state. We want a state that doesn't that, that abides by its bounds. But I would say that in order to get a limited state, you actually can't have a neutral state. Because unless the state recognizes uh, the, the 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 existence of a lawgiver, the existence of a higher of a higher order above itself, um, it won't. There's nothing to limit it. And there's nothing to keep it within the bounds of its own. Um, of its own um, desires. And I think what we're seeing in modern society is the state, um, out of a desire to solve problems, to put it in its, in its best construction, sure. operating in, in every corner of human life. Um, right. And actually in a way that is, that is um, often destructive of, of, human, of human flourishing, of human pa- patterns of the, the, the kind of right patterns of human um, existence um, and and the only way we're going to, to, to get the state to abide by limitations uh, is by that state acknowledging that that it that it receives its remit from someone who is who is above itself uh, who is uh, you know the, the the god of the the god and father of our lord jesus christ absolutely i think that's that's an interesting way to to kind of conceive of it where the state's kind of invasive and looking into every corner because ultimately that's the way we should want the gospel and God to, uh, we should submit to him in such a way that, that he is uh, not pushed into the corner, like relegated into a corner, like a child in time out, but pushed into the corner where there's not a, there's not a square inch, so to speak with Kuiper, where he's not uh, championed and worshiped. And so for many of my kind of gospel centered brethren, so to speak, they're very content to have Christ in kind of a neutral place where he's not kind of expanded into the corners. And, and I think that what that gives room for is the state to take over those places where they're micromanaging every detail and they become almost godlike in their self-perception where there's, I was just in the UK and there's cameras everywhere, you know, and they're, they're watching everything. And so they, they think they can control things as, as a godlike entity. And so when the state does not acknowledge that their self-limitation based on the creator it becomes very problematic to say the least. And for some people, they, you know, they, they still have kind of this libertarian ethic because they're American and they, you know, it's uh, the flag. The, there's this flag called the Gadsden flag uh, where it's, you know, don't step on me. Yes. Uh, and, and they still want that kind of re- that neutral uh, American government where people are free to self-express and that kind of thing. And, and I resonate with that in some ways because it's, that's, that's an interesting ideal to aspire to. But I also see it as a dead project, kind of dead on arrival, because it doesn't acknowledge the creator and it doesn't have any kind of ideal outside of the self, where it's almost necessarily a populist attitude. Actually, Aaron Wren is, I think he mentioned that. I was very... He, that was an episode that really challenged me because I kind of was like, uh, you know, don't step on me. That was kind of like an attitude I had as a as an American. And, and when Ren highlighted the incongruency of that with kind of a Christian ethic, uh, that really helped me kind of see how libertarianism isn't a, um, a really helpful 
or sustainable vision for uh, Christianity in the state? Yeah, I, I mean, I, th- I think the um, what what you know, I think it was Edmund Burke who said that if men will not be constrained from within, they will have to be constrained from without. Mm. So if you don't have the, the the problem is an incorrect understanding of liberty. So we we read in the scriptures, you know, Jesus says, you know, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, Paul says, for freedom's sake, that you've been you've uh, been set free. You know, freedom is is a is a very high value in Christianity, but it's freedom defined in a certain way. It's free. It's a positive freedom to a certain end. We're made for a certain for a certain end, um, and the freedom and and the the ability just to 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 do whatever we want when what we want is destructive and dehumanizing is actually slavery. Um, Mm. and so when you, but when you have people who live and live, um, according to live in the light of human ends, um, kind of of their own accord, you know, they, 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 um, they, they, they work hard. They want to bring up a family or they want to, to, to serve their community. they, that they they're not um, you know greedy for to to kind of you know um, pilfer from other people and, and so on. Then you don't need you don't need uh, huge amounts of, of kind of compulsion from the outside to say you know look you need you know I'm gonna if you don't uh, you, you you can create an orderly society with very minimal state state power state interference. Right. When you have people who are just completely driven by by instincts and by by whatever appetites they have. Then, of course, unless you're going to have chaos, you need to have very high levels of of state control. Um, and so, what I think we are, are are kind of this is part of the what I was trying to say in that article on on Calvinism and liberty is that Calvinism creates a certain type of liberty. It's the liberty to live for, or I should say, Christianity. Really, I mean, as a it's 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 the Christian, you know. It's 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 not a sectarian thing. It's it's the Christian message in general creates the space for human beings to live according to the ends for which they were made, which you know they should do naturally. They should do kind of that. That is the ordinary way of things. Um, but as you say, when you when you get um, when you when you get a people who are who are kind of just totally shaped by by immediacy and by appetites then you need to have the state regulating everything uh, right. that, you, that you do. At least you have an excuse for the state to regulate everything that you do. Um, but, of course, that's much less effective than internal, um, internal constraint. Um, yeah. and, and I think the thing about that is, is that what I've been reflecting on the last few days is that when you have an internally constrained, uh, you know, uh, self-constrained people who live... Uh, you know, kind of disciplined, um, not, not necessarily Christian, but just kind of externally moral lives. You, know, you just kind of live their own life um, in a in a in a way that is that is kind of um, ordered and, and and so on. That actually is a great challenge to any state that wishes to exceed its own power. Right. That's when you get that counterbalance of the state and the people is when you have a people who without any, you know, external incentive or external constraint, just live. You know, this is the way I want to live. I, they own they, they, they own things. They have responsibility for things. They, right. they, they act uh, morally. That's actually a great threat to any would be tyrant because those are the people who are difficult to get to to manipulate to get to do right. things that are that they that go against their consciences um and it struck me that many of the things we've been offered in the last 50 40 years as rebellion whether it be drugs whether it be kind of the sexual revolution or or you know even even kind of um you know the internet and some of the dynamics that have gone with that they have actually acted to um, dissolve and um, kind of lessen the power of of people. They've they've made right. it harder for people to live 
disciplined lives, orderly lives, self-possessed lives, to own property, to build up wealth, to, to, to earn and, and so on, and pass things on to, to generations. Um, and they've actually met, that has, so all of those things were kind of offered as like, oh, you know, it's rebellious to take drugs, it's rebellious to, to um, you know, live outside of the bounds of an ordinary family. Those things have actually served to make politi- actual political rebellion against those who with state power, those those with with significant power, much less likely. Um, right. And I think um, I think that's it's a very interesting the way rebellion you know rebellion has been used actually to increase the servitude of of the people, um, and it's right. because of this this misunderstanding of what liberty is that liberty is not the power to just satisfy immediate appetites but liberty is actually to is the ability to live according to the proper ends um that we have absolutely and i think that's a great way to kind of close is is ultimately as christians we believe that the preaching of the gospel the renewing of hearts um, by the power of the holy spirit regenerating hearts empowers them to live virtuous lives and ultimately we want virtuous societies uh, with properly ordered structures of government that uh, acknowledge their own bounds, but that's going to come through the, the preaching of the gospel in a, in a very robust way, um, powerful way, and, and a way that maybe we've been lacking some teeth uh, for the last 50 years. And so uh, why don't we close out there? I, th- I think this was a great episode, fantastic to talk with you. I, I could keep talking with you, and, and I want to have you back on because I think we're uh, academically heading in two different, not directions, but I, I started with Trinitarian stuff and that was my book. And now I'm going into history. You, you seem to have started with history and now you're going into Trinitarian theology. So we'll definitely want to keep talking, but if people wanted to follow you is, um, is Twitter one of the, one of the prime ways or a website, where yeah, can people I keep mean, up with you? I, 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 uh, I, I tweet the odd, the odd thing, uh, at, at GJ Shearer. It's a, a G J S H. E A R E R, and um, uh, I do, as I've got a blog, which is a, there's a link to that on my Twitter profile, um, and I occasionally, occasionally, something pops out in between my my PhD studies. But um, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where they can where people can find me. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with me on the uh, the episode. It's been a privilege. Yeah, it's been honor. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. If you're a listener, I'd love for you to share this episode with somebody else. Start a conversation. And um, subscribe, click the, uh, click the bell icon if you're on YouTube, leave a rating if you're on, uh, on a podcast platform. I've also got a Patreon link in the show notes, so I'd love for you to click on that, help support the podcast, help kind of make these great interviews that I enjoy so much and hopefully you enjoy as well, uh, keep coming to life. So uh, thank you so much for listening today and until next time, we will see you.